All right, I think it's 12 o'clock. Actually, I think it's 12.03. <laughs> Sorry about that. Got to get a coffee. I was um, moving some things around. So you can tell I got some USB things going on. So anyway, uh, it is Tech Thursday. It is 12.03. I'm three minutes late. I apologize for that. Just uh, trying to get ready. So, all right, welcome to, I believe I'm live. Am I live? Am I live? Restream. So, welcome to a, a Tech Thursday. Today's topic, uh, remember I'm splitting this into two sections now. I have, um, I got a part one and a part two. We're going to be talking the table method, 70E. <laughs> And you know, you know it's kind of bad, hey Ronald. You know it's kind of bad when I got to get, uh, I got to, I have to have uh, a magnifying glass and glasses. So I, I, I was just rooting through the drawers over here, and I found my magnifying glass. But in any case, seventy E. Uh, we're talking. I got my coffee. We're talking table method and um, determining personal protective equipment. Determining personal protective equipment and um, using either the table method. And, and, and in reality, I, I, I have this discussion a lot with in, der in, in various forms. When it comes to the calculation method, I think we have to separate our discussion and understand our audience. Because we have label makers out there in the field. And we have label readers. So what I want to focus on in this session is more so the label reader. And if the label's not available, we're going to leverage 70E to help us understand how to um, select our personal protective equipment. Now, I want to qualify things here. I'm not speaking on behalf of anybody other than myself. What you hear this hour is my opinion, my opinion only, not of NFPA, not of IAEI, not of uh, NFPA 70E panel members and National Electrical Code panel members or NEMA. This is numero uno, my opinion, and you are more than free to uh, disagree with me. And if you do, use the chat. Hard to work in an electrical panel for me with bifocals and a magnifier. Engineer, not electrician. Pity on the older electricians. Yes. Well, I'll tell you what. Get your spectacles out. If you need your magnifying glass, get that out. But you're going to need 70E. And I want to talk about uh, the table method. And, and, and I want to talk about the labeling. So the first, the first place we're going we're gonna to start is in Article 1, remember, since we're, since we are dealing with an electrical hazard, we know we're going to be doing justified energized work. Right, William? Code Ninjas, excellent. Thanks, William Snyder. Thanks for sharing. Share and share alike. And please uh, comment and comment back and, um, I don't have my, I got to open up, I'm going to open up my Facebook and I will open up my LinkedIn. Um, I believe all the comments should come through this one, but I believe LinkedIn comments don't come in through, uh, through this chat. So I'm going to just so bear with me if I accidentally, okay, I'm muted over there. I can see, okay, Mark. Mark Fusina, thank you for joining uh, out there on LinkedIn. Uh, we're streaming to seven different channels. So Nihad El Sharif, excellent. Yeah, and I got, I'm going to, Nihad, uh, our five o'clock program is going to be a continuation of this discussion. So let's talk. The first thing uh, that I want to discuss is in 130.5, we talk about an arc flash risk assessment. So remember, risk. Risk is likelihood and severity. How do we know that? Because it's defined in 70E. When I look at the definition of risk, 
is a combination of the likelihood of occurrence of injury or damage to health and the severity of injury or damage to health that results from the hazard. And one of the ways I always talk about risk is uh, and, and, and whatnot is, is uh, usually I'm flying somewhere and I know that I'm going to get on a plane. What is my risk? So if I think about severity, if my plane goes down, it's pretty severe, right? Pretty much everybody's going to be dead on board. Pretty much. Likelihood of that happening is very high. But the likelihood of a plane crash is very low. And how do we know the likelihood of that plane crash? Because we have all the safety procedures in place. I know the pilot has gone through training. I know there are rules on, on, uh, on how many hours of sleep that pilot is supposed to have. I know there's two people up there in the cockpit. I know there are safety provisions on that plane. We are reducing the likelihood of the plane going down because we are increasing all of these safety features and functions and standards and codes. So we have to always weigh our risk associated with likelihood and severity. The first place that we go to likelihood of an occurrence of an arc flash incident is table 130.5C, Charlie. So the first thing we have to do is say, look, and if you look at 130, and I'm in the 2021 version of uh, 70E. If I look at table 130.5, Charlie, it says estimate, the title of it is estimate of the likelihood of occurrence of an arc flash incident for AC and DC systems. So the way this table is oriented, it's task based. So the first thing is I am going to, I have, I have equipment condition. Remember condition of maintenance is another very important aspect of all of this. And we're going to understand that as we get into selecting personal protective equipment as well, right? So Condition of maintenance is an plays an important role in severity and possibly likelihood too, right? Because um, if, for example, I've never maintained my electrical equipment and it's rusted and things internally are rusted, if I try to take the cover off, things may fall, something may fall inside on energized bus and cause an arc flash event just because I didn't maintain the integrity of the enclosure. So condition of maintenance is important. And from a severity perspective, now that's a likelihood issue. From a severity perspective, um, I can increase severity because I didn't do maintenance because my overcurrent protective device takes more time to clear. All right. So um, I'm checking LinkedIn. All right. So so table 130.5C is my first, uh, my first stop in this whole arc flash thing. And, and what you'll notice is task-based. So if I'm reading a panel meter while operating a meter switch, if the equipment condition is any equipment condition, the likelihood of occurrence is no. So I don't have a likelihood of occurrence. If I'm examining insulated cable with no mani manipulation of the cable, any condition, I'm not manipulating the cable, I'm just looking at it, doesn't matter the condition of the equipment, there's no likelihood of an occurrence. I'm working on control circuits with exposed energized electrical conductors and circuit parts, nominal 125 volts AC or DC or below, without any other exposed energized equipment over nominal 125 volt AC or DC, including opening of hinge covers to gain access. I have any condition, no likelihood of an occurrence of an arc flash event. Now, do I have a shock hazard? Absolutely, that's a whole other subject. But I don't, have an, I don't have an arc flash hazard if I meet these requirements. Now, let's go down to, uh, if I go down through this, this uh, table, it says um, for, a, uh, for AC systems, work on energized electrical conductors and circuit parts, including electrical testing. Any condition? Yes, likelihood of, uh, of an arc flash. Removal or installation of circuit breakers or switches, any condition? Yes, a likelihood. So this helps me understand the likelihood. Now, once I understand that there's a likelihood of an arc flash event based upon what I'm doing, <laughs> I forced you to open this. So there, you know what? My job is done. 
My job is done, is completed. You opened the book. You said you have the same book on the floor next to me. You forced me to open for the first time. I see NFPA watermark on every page. My eyes are good enough for that. You're right. You're right. All right. So uh, thanks for, for opening and cracking the binding of your book, your 70 e book. And it was on the floor so that, you know what, the other, the other th uh, test that you passed is it is readily accessible. All right. You didn't have to move anything to get it. All right. How about um, maintenance and testing on individual battery cells? This is a uh, table 130.5C um, or individual multi-cell units in an open rack, abnormal equipment condition. Yes. Likelihood of occurrence. All right. So we have, we have that down now. If, um, if I'm reading a label, let's say that I did, I'm in a, I call it, I call it, and I think others have, because I, I, I don't create the stuff on my own. I've heard people call the, when you have arc flash labels in your facility, a labeled environment. Now you have to understand how the label was created. And I'll tell you why that's important. The reason that is important is because if I do a calculation and I determine incident energy for a piece of equipment, panel board, switch board, disconnect, wherever, an industrial control panel, I, I, do a, I use SKM, EDSA, Easy Power, any one of those applications, and I create a label. The person who's going to dress has to understand how I created that label. Why? Because if I'm in 130.5G, incident energy analysis method, it says the incident energy analysis shall take into consideration, blah, 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 blah. Table 130.5G identifies the arc rating, arc rated clothing and other PPE requirements of Article 130 and shall be permitted to be used with the incident energy analysis method of selecting arc flash personal protective equipment. That's table 130.5G. Now, you might be familiar with the table method in 130.7 for determining PPE. And we're going to get to that. But 130.7 Charlie 15A table, and that's on page 70E-35, if you're using that analysis, if that method of determining PPE, it'll give you an arc flash PPE category, and then you go to table 130.7 Charlie 15C on page 37 to determine your PPE. That's only if you're using the table method. If you're doing the calculation for 130.5G, which is on page 26. That tells you to determine your personal protective equipment, you need to use 130.5G table, which is going to be a little different than the other table. So, table 130.5G is in George. Selection of arc rated clothing and other personal protective equipment when the incident energy analysis method is used. So if I see a, an existing label on equipment, I have to know if the incident energy analysis method was used. And, and what's an indicator of that? An indicator of that could be the calories per centimeter squared, right? Let's look at equipment labeling. Equipment labeling is in 130.5H. 130.5H on page 29. Electrical equipment such as switchboards, panel boards, industrial control panels, meter sockets, enclosures, and motor control centers that are in other than dwelling units and that are likely to require examination, adjustment, servicing, or maintenance while energized shall be marked with a label containing all of the following. So what are my options? I have to have nominal system voltage. I have to have my arc flash boundary. And I have to have at least one of the following. 
I can have A, an available incident energy, and the PPE corresponding working distance, or, so that would be in a calculation. If I'm going to put incident energy, I'm going to calculate that. Or, the arc flash PPE category that is in table 130.7, Charlie 15A. 130.7, Charlie 15A. We're going to talk about that. Or table 130.7, Charlie 15B. Now, A is AC systems. B is DC systems. But not both. That's an important piece of the puzzle. Remember in the old days, and you might find labels out there, they, ta they called them hazard risk categories. They did away with hazard risk categories in 70E. That was problematic. So what they do now is, A, you determine what is the likelihood. If there is a likelihood of an arc flash event, then B, I need to know the severity. And determine the severity. I can label my equipment with the severity. I can determine, I can label the calories per centimeter squared. Right? I can label the calories per centimeter squared per 130.5H labeling, equipment labeling. I can put the available incident energy, that's the calories per centimeter squared, and the corresponding working distance, which would be like 18 inches or something like that. Or I put the PPE category, the arc flash PPE category, which is out of 137, 130.7 Charlie 15A. So it's categories one, two, and four. There's no category three. I mean, we have we have how to dress for a category three, but there is no category three in the table. But so I can use one of those, and then you have to have the minimum arc rating of clothing, and you have uh, or, 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 this is not and, this is or. So you can have A, the available instant energy, or the PPE category number. B, you could also simply put the minimum arc rating of clothing. And that could be something that the, that the site, like say, for example, you are working for Tommy D and in, in Tommy D Basement Incorporated, okay? You're in Tommy D, a basement incorporated, and, and what we're going to do is I'm going to require you to wear personal protective equipment. I, I, I'm going to make you, I'm going to tell you, you need to have your helmet on. I'm going to tell you exactly what you need to wear in, in, uh, based upon the application. I'll do the, the analysis. And, and maybe I want you to dress in two ways. Maybe I am going to say, look, you're going to either wear, um, you're either going to wear a, a four or eight calorie. Say it's eight calories. You're going to wear eight or 40, period. In, in Tommy D's basement uh, grew, uh, company. And I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to label all my equipment, either with an eight or a 40. I'm going to tell you what PPE you're supposed to wear. And that's based upon how I'm going to do my marking. I could, I could, I could, if I wanted to, based on, uh, based on this equipment labeling, site-specific level of PPE. I could do that. I could do a minimum arc rating of clothing. So I have options for or how I can mark it. And it says the method of calculating and the data to support the information for the field label shall be documented. So however you came across, if you said, look, this is, uh, this is how you're going to dress. This is a 40 calorie outfit, period. And, and, and Bala Club, I could give a color coding. However, my site specific level is done. I can do that. So, Hey, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much for the feedback, brother. So, so the, the important thing is I'm going to determine and I'm going to put on the label, but I want to make sure the people who are working on my equipment are dressing the way I need them to dress. That's living in a, I'm calling it a labeled environment. But note 
that I can use the PPE category method. Table 130.7, Charlie 15C. I can use, I'm sorry, A and B and C. I can use this PPE category method to label all of my equipment. And what am I going to do? I'm going to put Arc Flash category labels on. I'm going to say, look, this is an Arc Flash PPE category two, right? Um, so I have, I'm going to have the voltage. I'm going to have the arc flash boundary. If I'm using a PPE category two, table 130.7, Charlie 15A tells me I'm at a three foot boundary. So I can put three foot as my arc flash boundary. Then I have at least one of the following, an available incident in energy. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to use the category method uh, or the arc flash PPE category. So that would say that's a category two. So I can put the number two. Uh, on, on my label. Notice there's no date requirement. And, and I had an issue with that. Uh, there's no, I, I, I would have to go back to my study or back to the documentation and the data to understand when that number was arrived upon or look at the short circuit study. When was the last time the short circuit study was done? When was the last time um, a coordination study was done to understand maybe the vintage of the label, right? Uh, and, and, and I know the, there have been public inputs and public comments. That's right. Your available fault currents can change, but there's no date requirement for marking on these labels. And here was the reasoning. And I, 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 um, Part of me agrees with it, part of me disagrees with it. I understand the challenge. Uh, here's the challenge. Let's say that nothing in my system, I, I'm, I'm gone for five years. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm gone for five years, but I've existed. Tommy D's basement uh, facility has existed for five years. Absolutely zero change in Tommy D's basement. Okay, we painted some walls. Uh, maybe I got, a, uh, I got a new amp, but um, my available fault current didn't change. My arc flash uh, labeling didn't change. Nothing changed. If I had a date on it, every five years at least, I'd have to relabel all of my equipment with a new date. There are ways, in my opinion, around that. Okay, what do they do on gas pumps? They do this on gas pumps, don't they? They have a date system on gas pumps, on fuel pumps, when they're calibrated. And they have the little punches, or they have the little marks. So I think there are ways around that, and in my opinion, we need a date on these labels. That's just my opinion. Not everybody agrees with it. Um, I think it should be dated. So, and, and, and that, you know what that means? That's a good uh, opportunity for a public input for the next cycle of 70E. And if we get more people asking for that date, they'll just get tired of saying no, in my opinion. Be the squeaky wheel. Be the squeaky wheel. Be one with the squeaky wheel. So, uh, so we understand the labeling. So I understand that I can label it. I can calculate incident energy, and I can label it with my calculated numbers, with my arc flash boundary. If I calculate the calories per centimeter squared, what I don't do is I don't go to the table method and put the, if I go to the uh, table 130.7, Charlie 15C, PPE category two says an arc rated uh, clothing minimum of eight calories. I don't label my equipment eight calories. That would be ungood. The only time you're going to see a calorie per centimeter squared on a, on a piece of equipment is because you did a calculation of calories per centimeter squared. So. Uh, be mindful of, of that. I'm just closing some stuff over here. Okay. I had, uh, I had Teams open, and I still have Teams open. If somebody wants to dial in, I mean, I can, I can share. Or if somebody, whoops. I don't know what I did there. Category 1, 2, 3, 4, 4, 8, 25, 40. I own a 12 and a 40. <laughs> All right, um, you own a 12 and a 40. I know a lot of facilities that will have their employees dress one of two ways. That's it. 
And I think that's, that's a good thing. It's, it's simplicity. You can, you can, um, you can train them on how to don the equipment. You can make it easy for them to understand when to wear whichever level. And then you can tell whoever makes changes and designs your system, these are my two numbers. You got to hit them. I know we have customers. I've worked to, with customers of ours where we had the design uh, uh, criteria that we had to hit a certain number in calories. We had to stay below a certain number. That's what they wanted. And we had to change our designs to get them to those numbers that would help them with that. Derek Vixtel, driving on my way to the hotel. Excellent. Hey, you know what, uh, Derek, if you want to get on at five o'clock, let me know. Shoot me a note. We'll, uh, we, can, we can chat it up uh, together on, uh, at five o'clock. I know you're driving now, so we ain't doing it. But in any case, so, so here we, here's what we got going on. So we, got, so we have the, the, um, the calories per centimeter squared. Hey, Nikolai Tesla, welcome to the team, brother. If I am in a labeled environment where I've calculated calories per centimeter squared, I'm going to determine my personal protective equipment based upon 130.5G. And this is why NHZXBOI says he has a 12 calorie and a 40 calorie outfit. Because table 130.5G tells you the first range is 1.2 to 12 calories. And the second range is greater than 12 calories. So regardless of what your number is, if you have um, if you have a four calorie or an eight calorie event, you can wear an eight calorie outfit. It says arc rated clothing with an arc rating equal to or greater than the estimated incident energy. But you could have eight calories on one panel, 12 calories on another panel, three calories on another panel, four calories on another panel. You're not going to have clothing for every calorie per centimeter squared. And, and um, uh, you can, <laughs> your eyes wasn't me. Engineers, a very good thing. Changes uh, need to be a reset on the evaluation. And commissionings where they're also changing switch gear. Uh, that is a significant and probable change of arc flash category. Cata generally, that is not considered uh, ought to be outages. Uh, yeah, so, 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 You don't want to have to stock multiple calories. And 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 NHZXBOI, I can't remember if it's Kevin. Anyway, 12 calorie outfits, they the, the clothing has become more comfortable these days. Layering helps a lot. And what they'll tell you in from 1.2 to 12 calories, you have to have an arc rated clothing equal to or greater than the estimated incident energy. Arc rated long sleeve shirt and pants, or arc rated coveralls, or an arc flash suit, uh, arc rated face shield, and balaclava. Now, it's a big difference between table 130.5G from 1.2 to 12 calories. The balaclava is needed. If you do the, when are you not driving to a hotel? <laughs> David Curry says. Um, if you do the category method, PPE category one is up to four calories. You do not need a balaclava. Now, um, and remember, it, it's just landing in Atlanta. You want to call in the noon show or I can do a video in the afternoon show. Or if you don't mind, I can video into the first show too from baggage claim. Oh, my goodness gracious. Now, we're going to we'll do it at five o'clock. Um, anyway, hopefully you can join us at five, uh, Derek. Uh, I'll, I'll send you. A, I'll send you a, a team meeting. So we're gonna have Derek Vixtel online. Uh, great guy, great guy. And and you can update everybody on where you're working now. So um, the table method 
in table 130.7, Charlie 15C, the, I think the biggest difference between that and what's in 130.5G is between from for for four calories and less, you don't need a balaclava. But if you look at everything else, they're very much in line with what's in 130.5G. You need your hard hat, you need your safety glasses, your hearing protection, and your leather footwear, uh, leather footwear. Um, and, and again, PPE category one is an odd beast. And remember, that is PPE category one, and we're going to go over it, but that's typically your 120 up to 240 volts uh, systems and a, ma and a maximum of 25,000 amps. So, and you have to be downstream of a multi case circuit breaker. So, in any case, that's uh, the, the, the major difference between 130.5G uh, clothing and 130.7 Charlie 15C clothing recommendations or requirements. And then when you get above 12 calories, now again, you're still going to have to have an arc flash category. Um, equal clothing equal to or greater than the arc flash uh, estimated incident energy. Uh, uh, you need to have your, your suit hood. Um, they, they don't have the balaclava and the face shield because now you need an arc rated hood, right? So they're not telling you you can use a face shield above 12 calories and, and a good question which i haven't finally answered to yet is why 12 who came up with 12 is that what got you to two-thirds i don't know i'm just saying um i'm just going to do this real quick i'm going to look let me know it is a beautiful piece of history oh you got one. Oh, okay all right doom 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 doom, doom. All right, so, so we know that if I am calculating incident energy, squeak, squeak, amen, brother. I'm calculating incident energy. I'm doing my labeling. I'm putting my voltage, my arc flash boundary, and I'm putting incident energy, calories per centimeter squared. I'm going to be using table 130.7, nope. I'm going to be using table 130.5G to determine my personal protective equipment. That I think is, a, is very important. Don't make the mistake of still using 130.7 Charlie 15C. All right, so. Now the other, the other aspect of this is you have to make sure that the equipment is maintained. You have to make sure that the You have to make sure the equipment is maintained. And you notice I got a Band-Aid. I wasn't wearing my PPE. I cut my finger. I was over there and I washed my dishes. And I have a knife. And I had the towel. Towel. And you know how you use a towel and you take it over the blade? Well, when your one hand is holding the towel from moving and you go to move over the blade and your hand finger is on the blade, I cut myself very deep. No stitches, though. But I wasn't wearing a proper PPE and I wasn't uh, being safe. Anyway. I don't even know why I went down that road. I think because <laughs> I'm staring at a Band-Aid. So um, that's the first, uh, first thing to remember if you are calculating incident energy you're going to be using the right table. You're going to be looking for condition of maintenance. Why? Because my calories per centimeter squared is going to be dependent upon my arcing current. It's going to be dependent upon the clearing time. If my breakers aren't maintained, my clearing time is going to be longer. If my clearing time is longer, then I have higher incident energy. I think that is the hardest part for the electrical worker. The hardest part of all of this. Using the right table, you can teach people that. Trying to determine condition of maintenance, that is a challenge. So especially in a facility where you don't have a very well-documented 
maintenance program, right? So you, you as, as uh, facility owners, as engineers providing value to our customers, Oh, excellent, Derek. Derek will be with us at five o'clock, all mic'd up and ready to go. Beautiful. Uh, make sure you send me your new email address, Derek. I don't know if I have it. So uh, shoot me a note on your email address. You know mine, Thomas A. Dimitrovich at Eaton.com. I'll put it in here, put it in the chat. I'll put it over here. Or uh, just uh, send it via LinkedIn. Be easier. Okay, so. Uh, the hardest part is determining uh, condition of maintenance. So now that tells you the calculation method. Um, uh, NXZ, sorry, by outages, I mean you have a week to get changes done. Many contractors, many contractors, many interwining things. The changes are often poorly communicated. In the end, legitimate numbers are needed. You're absolutely right. So here's, here's the challenge throughout the, the life of the, let's just, what does the A stand for? Awesome! No, it's Thomas Allen Dimitrovich. And my, um, my confirmation name, because I'm Catholic, is John. From my Uncle John. And John uh, the Baptist. That, uh, John the Baptist. What a guy. Anyway. I don't talk religion or politics. Stephen Froming. Okay. Um, so, 130.5G, we talked about that. Calculated method, condition of maintenance, use the right table. Um, now we're going to get to the table method. We're going to start into the table method. I'm going to do an overview. And then maybe at five o'clock, I mean, we will have a, 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 a detailed discussion with Derek on some of the stuff that he's been hearing. But the table method, um, I can tell you what they mean. But if you look at the language, it can be challenging. This is giving me a little ripple right here. Anyway. Okay, so let's talk about the table method. Uh, th this would be in section, it's on page 33 is where we're going to start. So I know you all have purchased your copy of 70E. NHZX BOI had his sitting next to him on the floor, cracked it for the first time during this live session. Great job. So let's take a look at. Section 130.7, personal and other protective equipment. If I look at 130.7, Charlie is titled personal protective equipment. Now, the first problem that I've heard uh, people tell me is the problem with personal protective equipment is the first word. It's not typically personal, right? Who wants to get into the 40 cal outfit that I just sweated my butt in for, for eight hours? You ain't going to want to do it. Unless I wear a lot of cologne and a lot of underarm deodorant. Um, but um, the, the, the challenge is the, per, the, the first part of it. But really, in reality, the 12 calories, the 8 calorie outfits, those are very comfortable clothing that um, you can wear as daily wear. And, and throwing your balaclava or throwing on a baklava is not that difficult. You should always wear your balaclava. Uh, remember, it's, it's, this is your, um, you want to go home, and you want to go home looking the same way that you came, that you left in the morning. That's the other important part. So 130.7, Charlie. It tells us that... Bada bing, bada boom, bada bang. Um, personal protective equipment, you've got general requirements, you've got movement and visibility that's important, head, face, neck, and chin, all this other good stuff. But if you go over to 15, so now, so 130.7 is on page 30. 
130.7 Charlie is on page 30. There's all of these sections. They go from one all the way to 15 or beyond, to infinity and beyond. Yes, to 15. So uh, each of these sections, you've got general requirements, you've got movement and visibility, head, face, and neck, and chin. You have eye protection, hearing protection, body protection, hand and arm protection. You've got footy protection, factors in selecting protective clothing, about layering, outer layers, inner layers, the inner layer. This is just an into to an intro to five o'clock. No, NXC. No, this is not an intro. Remember, we're going to continue our discussion at five o'clock. I'm splitting a two hour program or a two hour discussion into two one hour discussions. So we're not covering this stuff this afternoon. We're going to be into something a little different, or we're going to be building on this discussion. Arc Flash protective equipment talks about Arc Flash suits. That's number 10. 11 is clothing material characteristics. Very important. 12 is clothing and other apparel not permitted. And then 13 is care and maintenance. Maintenance is important. Uh, and if you watched on my channel, I had Mr. Margolin. He is. He is a, um, he is uh, on, uh, if you go to my website, thomasdimitrovich.com, he is a member. I just want to confirm it. He is a member of the Buck 41 Club. Scott Margolin should be there. There he is. And he was on my channel. We talked about the proper care of PPE. So if you, if you're not aware of that, go check out, go to, go to my YouTube site. and. Um, and I think you could probably go out to my website too. But in any case, uh, that is 13, care and maintenance. 14 is standards for PPE. So this it speaks to uh, the, the ANSI standards and whatnot, and the marking requirements, uh, and the conformity assessment, all that great stuff. The name, what, what you're supposed to have on your personal protective equipment. Make sure you're not using you know, flame resistant um, and not arc resistant. So anyway. And then 15 is your category method. Now, we're going to get into a lot more depth on the category method at 5 o'clock. We're going to have our buddy Derek Vigstel, the, the Derek, Derek Vigstel, online with us. Um, alternating current equipment, 130.7, Charlie 15A, and incident and energy analysis shall be required in accordance with one. So it says... Alternate current AC code. When arc flash risk assessment performance in accordance with 130.5 indicates that an arc flash PBE is required, because remember, that was what we talked about earlier. You have to determine if the likelihood is there. If there's no likelihood of an arc flash event, you're not dressing for an arc flash event, you're not calculating an arc, arc flash or anything like that. Remember that. But once you've determined that, then you are, um, that's in final electrical problems. Then you are uh, having to determine all this good stuff. All right. So I'm just looking to make sure I'm picking up uh, any questions and whatnot. All right. I don't see any questions over there. We got some chatting up over there. You know, I'm noticing. I'm not getting the chats from LinkedIn through here. I got to check that out. Anyway, so it says um, when, the, uh, when the arc flash risk assessment for formula quartz with 130 indicates that an arc flash PP is required, and let's just go back to 130.5. I just want to make sure that I'm not teaching and I'm not talking wrong. Yes, 130.5, that's that table. That's based on what you're going to do, the likelihood. Um, and the arc flash PPE category method is used for the selection of PPE for AC systems in lieu of the incident energy analysis of 130.5G. You don't do them both. You do one or t'other. Table 130.7 Charlie 15A shall be used to determine the arc flash PPE category, and that is for alternating current systems. So, and it says, Okay, 
the estimated maximum available fault current, maximum fault clearing times, and minimum working distances for various AC equipment types or classifications are listed in Table 130.7, Charlie 15A. An incident energy analysis shall be required in accordance with 130.5G for the following. Power systems with greater than the estimated maximum available fault current. So if you're outside of the parameters of the table, you've got to do a calculation. Power systems with longer than maximum fault clearing times and less than the minimum working distance. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, so those are the three conditions. Now, okay, got 1248. Getting, we're getting close. Let's talk about the table. Um, so I have a little snapshot. Um, I got Moby. But I don't have it's Moby. I need I I, I, I I hold on, bear with me. I need ATEM. All right, so Mr. Froming, you'd be proud of me, brother. I have uh, leveraged my ATEM Mini Pro and alleviated some of the work on the processor of my streaming computer technology. I love it. All right, so on my, this is the table, 130.7, Charlie 15, right? That's the table, 130.7, Charlie 15A. You'll notice we are driven off of the equipment that we are working on. We have an arc flash PPE category that we need to think about. That tells us our category. We have the arc flash boundary that we will, uh, that is our, remember what is, what is an arc flash boundary? If I'm doing a calculation for arc flash, say I'm doing a calculation for my incident energy. I am going to calculate based upon distance, how far away to get to 1.6 calories per centimeter squared. I believe it's 1.6. Or is it 1.2? Arc flash boundary. You know how we, we, solve, we solve that one? We take the time to go back and look at boundary arc flash 1.2. The arc flash boundary is when an arc flash hazard exists, an approach limit from an arc source at which incident energy equals 1.2 calories per centimeter squared. Because what do we know? We know that the further we get back from the event, the less severe it is. Last comment, I very much enjoy your balance of assertiveness and humility. You hit the sweet spot on that. <laughs> You're the man. All right, so you want to get as far away as you can, but there is a level when if you're doing your analysis and your actual calculations, that's going to be where you get to 1.2 calories per centimeter squared. But remember that the tables are not, the tables are not based upon calculations. But they do give you an arc flash boundary. Okay? They give us an arc flash boundary, which is an important piece of, so if I'm doing a program, if I'm uh, doing a program, if I'm doing work on energized, justified energized work, I'm going to put my boundary and I want everybody else in the whole environment to understand, like, for example, say I'm, say I'm working on a, a panel board. And let's say that it is a 480 volt panel board. So 480 and up to 600 volts. So I'm in this. And let's say my available fault current is 20,000 amps. I can't exceed 25,000 amps. And Let's say that I have a maximum of a 0.03 two cycle fault clearing time, and we'll talk about that. That's one of the comments that uh, Derek Fixtel had. 
I know my minimum, and I have a minimum working distance, 18 inches. I'm in a PPE category two, and my boundary is three foot. So what do I do? I'm going to make sure that anybody on that job site knows where my arc flash boundary is. I'm also going to have a shock boundary, right? So the boundaries, and there are there are um, there are rules for who can be in what boundaries, and um, you have the limited approach boundary. This is all shock related. And you have the restricted approach boundaries. This tells you who can be in that boundary from regard to shock, qualified or unqualified. And then you have the arc flash boundary. It says the arc flash boundary, this I'm on page 26, the arc flash boundary shall be the distance at which the incident energy equals 1.2. So we already talked about that. And then it says the arc flash boundary shall be permitted to be determined by table uh, 15A or 15B when the requirements of these tables apply. Uh, I don't have, I don't have, see what I have on the, um, I have the limited approach boundaries and it tells me who can work in the limited approach boundary, who can be in the restricted approach boundary. I know that I have to, anybody who's in the arc flash boundary has to be dressed appropriately. But I don't have anything in E that tells me if I have somebody that's in the arc flash boundary, but not in a limited approach boundary or a restricted approach boundary, because my arc flash boundary could be, you know, 50 feet behind me. And my restricted approach and limited approach can be much closer. The only thing I do know is that anything that is in the arc flash boundary, anything, any one, any part of your body that is in the arc flash boundary has to have clothing, has to have, uh, has to have the right personal protective equipment. And, and we're going to continue that this afternoon to find if there's any, any, any restrictions on who can be in the arc flash boundary. Outside of if you're dressed, I mean, I don't see anything. I don't see. I, I don't see anything in here that that speaks to that. And we can again continue that discussion this afternoon. So, I know my boundary, and and what we're going to talk about this afternoon is more about these parameters that are in um, that are in this table method, because I am. I, I have to, I think it's, I think we can all determine the voltage. That's not that hard. Okay, it's equipment rating. So we just look at switchboards, panel boards, um, industrial control panels. That's, that's, that's pretty straightforward. The available fault current, the available fault current, um, the available fault current can be, Can be a little tricky, but there are tools. You know, I could use the, um, I could estimate available fault current, right? I'll show you another trick, Mr. Uh, Mr. Um, Derek uh, uh, Vixel and, um, and Mr. Steve Froming. I'm gonna show you another little trick. Right, so I could open up my app. I could go to my electrical reference. I can go to the Busman app. And this is a free app available online for anybody. It's a, an app that you can install on your phone. You can use it on the computer. You, whether your phone is an Apple or an Android, I don't care. It don't care. Um, fault current calculator right there. I can estimate available fault current. Pick my English. I can go to uh, three phase and single phase, add to my system. I can say, I'm going to add a transformer. Let's say I'm downstream of a transformer. I'm going to assume an infinite bus. I can say, I got a 300 kVA transformer. I've got a uh, voltage on a secondary. I'd say I'm working at uh, 480 line to line. My impedance, let's say I'm at 3.5% impedance. Add to the system. And you would want to do the minus. And I'll tell you why. 
I'm gonna say no motor contribution, and I know I'm at 11,457 amps. So anywhere downstream of that transformer, I'm not exceeding, per this table, I'm not exceeding 25,000 amps. So I had a 300 kVA transformer. At a 3.5% impedance, I use the lower impedance value, the, plus, the minus 10%, because all transformers, based upon their labeling, based upon the standards, I can have plus or minus 10%. So I am, I use the lower to, to increase the fault current. And why is that okay? Because, because this table tells me that I have a maximum of 25,000 amps. And I know that if my number goes greater than 25,000 amps, I'm doing a calculation. Now, if I'm doing a calculation, I'm going to want to use the, the higher and the lower fault currents and all that jazz because I'm calculating arcing currents. But in the use of this table, you can estimate a higher number than what is actually there, and you're still within the parameters of the table. So for this 300 kVA transformer, i got to put that button in a better state place. Uh, I'm at 11,457 amps with an infinite bus on the primary, 300 kVA, 3.5% impedance, minus 10%, to get my maximum fault current, I know I will never go greater than 11,457 amps. That is less than the 25,000 amps. I am i don't care any equipment downstream of that transformer. I'm within the table. I can use it. The next step and difficult part of this, of this discussion is going to be determining the clearing time. And I will say it's easy. It's like Anna Marie Albighetti, the good seasons lady. It's in there. I'll say that's easy. And, and Derek and I are going to have a debate and a discussion about it because I understand where he's coming from, but I also understand the thought process behind this table, why it exists, what our goal is. And I'll just say that, and, and, and what helped me understand it was when I had an individual, a friend of mine, tell me, Tom, people aren't dying because they're not wearing the right PPE. People are dying because they're not wearing any PPE. So we have to, I think, in my opinion, understand that our goal is to get people into personal protective equipment. And we want to make it easy to do that. Right. So I will tell you, I'm going to ask you for a favor. I want you to subscribe. I want you to click the bell. There's not a lot of jingles here. I don't have uh, a huge group behind me. This is a one man band. We're going to have Derek Fixtel this afternoon. You're not going to want to miss him. I'm streaming on seven different channels, but I am going to be putting content on my YouTube channel, so please subscribe. Um, it's free. And it's full of information. At least I try. Remember, question all of what you hear and believe half of what you see. I need your dialogue. And I appreciate all the dialogue. Hey, Ali Saperi, thanks for joining switchgearcontent.com. You are the man. I really appreciate you joining in. We've had Derek Fixtel. We had David Curry online chatting it up. We had uh, my, Mark Fusina. We had Steve Froming in the house. Nikolai, the, the Nikolai Tesla. We had Joe Ballard. We had uh, Nihad El Sharif right from Egypt. When are you coming home? When are you coming back? Nihad, I still have your Shark, Shark Week mug. In fact, in fact, in fact, look, it says Nihad. I got to blow the dust off this thing. And it's your Shock Week mug, buddy. I got to get this to you. I am not shipping it to Egypt. All right? I sent, I sent Felix Sandoval his mug down to South America, Colombia, 
And I'm telling you, that was the most expensive cup I have ever seen. Um, so I owe you your Shock Week mug. I got it right here. I also owe you uh, your Buck 41. Because I believe you are a part of the Buck 41 Club. So I owe you your Buck 41, and I have it. Um, so please uh, get back to Canada, and hopefully I will see you at, uh, at a meeting that I can carry this, uh, this cup and uh, your shock, shock week mug uh, and give that to you. So I'm looking forward to that. All right. Shared passion, got it too. Totally forget about the Shock Week mug. Yes, you can't forget about this stuff. I, I, I can't remember everything for, for everybody. Come on, Nihad, I need you, brother. Jeez. All right. So, um, yes, we are going to meet in person soon, hopefully. All right, so that was, uh, it's 104. I started at 103. I was three minutes late. It is 104. I gave you an hour, and I'm supposed to be in another meeting, I think. No, I'm not. Most of my stuff was canceled this afternoon. So anyway, I will see you again at 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern, right here. Uh, uh, remember, get out there to YouTube. Subscribe. I've got another link for that. There's a link um, for part two. Uh, and we will be getting into the table method with Derek Vigstol. And we're going to have, I have, I have a feeling that me and Derek are going to tango. So I'm just saying, it's going to get loud. All right. It's going to get loud. It's going to get uh, mean. It's going to get, um, you're not going to want to miss it. All right. All right, Ali, thanks for joining us uh, from switchgearcontent.com. I really appreciate you and what you do as well. And you guys out there should check out switchgearcontent.com. He's got some stuff to offer. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining. Thanks for what you all do for electrical safety. Thanks for what you do for the electrical industry. Because if you're here talking or listening to this guy, then you, um, you care like I do. So, all right, we will see you. And don't. Don't be drying knives off and cutting your finger, all right? The good thing was it's a, it was a very sharp knife. I went very deep. I went very deep, but um, no stitches. I think I'm good. Okay, everybody, I'm going to shut this down. Thank you very much, and we will see you again at 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern with Derek Vigstol. Take care. Stay safe. And remember, stay healthy.